Okay. Yep, we used to have oyster roasts right out of that thing. Many a time, Frank Machero really enjoyed having uh, roasted oysters out here. And uh, tell them about Ed, Ed Bender's project. Yeah, Ed Bender worked on stone crabs. And so we always had, he did his own stone crab trapping, so we always had lots and lots of stone crabs to eat. And he ended up finding out that a lot of the fishermen, you were only supposed to take the big heavy claw, the crusher claw, but a lot of them would take both claws and they were only supposed to be taken from males and of course you can't sex a claw. So his recommendation when he finished all his work was that they collect the whole crab, and, but the state never did that. But we ate good. The, uh, well, remember the area out here, Steve, uh, I don't think we ever found any, but we were always told that this was a real good uh, metal detector area for old Civil War buttons up here buried in the sand out back and that sort of thing from right. Civil War times. Of course, we had a lot of strict instructions, don't go back there. To me, this was a little bit forgotten side of the island because, you know, we were just told I didn't go back here much. We'd walk down, but you didn't get off the path and that sort of thing. And don't go out into the woods very much. Yeah, Partly because, because of all, of snakes, in those days, all the nesting birds out there. Mostly because of the birds. Yes. Well, let's go on down the path. When I did my research, I was working on brittle stars. And so I would come out here for three or four days at a time. And quite often I was the only person here. And the path always was fairly open like this, but there weren't any stairs, like we'll see stairs down at the bottom here. And at that time, there were no stairs. I was uh, working on sand dollars over here and uh, my favorite collection area was as you come into the, the uh, entrance to the seahorse channel, as we called it, that's where they were most prevalent. So. I couldn't do much collecting down here. Uh, you just didn't find them. But uh, my deal was picking a bunch up, hauling them to Gainesville, because that's where I worked on them, except that first summer. We were down here when I spent the whole time here. Of course, they've modified this pathway so it's much safer and a lot less erosion because more people come out here now. Yeah, back in the day it was quite a bit quicker to get down here because uh, one missed step and you could roll a long ways. Oops. Steve, this uh, laid over palm or that one, <coughs> I remember those. I don't know if they were, there were two like that, but. Yep, that was the one, were. that palm tree was much straighter. Everybody that came here took a picture of the sunset with that palm tree and it, it was sort of our iconic palm. Yeah. And it's definitely, um, there's a lot more erosion. Yeah, if that's, you look that's, at, that's at least been there 47 years. Oh yeah, at least. Yeah. Yep. If you look out here, you can see the grass. First it's mud or sand, and then it's a kind of grass called Diplanthera. And then just where the water is, is turtle grass. So I had two stations out here, one in the Diplanthera zone and one in the turtle grass. And on a tide like this, I would go out and fill big wash tubs full of sediment from a meter square and then I would drag it over the hill to the other side and spend the next two days sieving it through a quarter inch sieve and pulling the brittle stars out of it. So I spent a lot of time on this beach and if we walk, let's walk a little ways north because I want to show you some stuff. Usually you couldn't get too far north because the beach runs out up here at the point. 
but when you walked along this part, the trees were filled with pelicans. And as you walk along, some of them would fly. But in the nesting season, the young would be here. And for someone from Colorado who didn't know much about this stuff, seeing all of these pelicans was just a magical thing. It's a horseshoe crab, lots of horseshoe crabs at certain times of the year would be up here nesting. The females bury in the, in the sediment and then lay their eggs and the males are on top of them releasing sperm. Yeah, a lot of times this beach would be pretty well populated with horseshoe crabs, wasn't it, Steve? Yes. And of course, when we came out here with classes, we would wait until the tide was in and it would be knee deep here and the water was so clear you could just walk along and you'd see fish and crabs and all kinds of things out here on the flat and you could just look down and pick them up and it was it was really nice we used to tell people there were four kinds of biting insects out here there were horse flies five green heads then a fly that we called dog flies that looked like a house fly except they could bite and then mosquitoes and no seams and I did a behavior project once out here where I was looking at fish foraging behavior and the dog flies were out so it was just a day like this very hot and I was sitting on a chair with the fish in front of me completely covered with my raincoat and my long pants and I was covered with flies. And that's when I decided I didn't want to be a behavioral researcher. <laughs> okay, let's go the other way. Well, the noceums used to attack too. Dawn and dusk were their worst times. Uh, we used to bring out what we called pick coils. Uh-huh, And it yeah. was, you just burned them and they, they were six, seven hours. If you went to bed too early and uh, 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 started them too early, they'd burn out, and at dawn, the no seams would wake you up every morning because they were just biting the heck out of it because they would go right through the screen. They but, could uh, get through the screens. Yeah, no exactly. seams were probably my biggest bane. I didn't like those. I didn't, oh yeah. I didn't, I didn't sit out here in the. In well, the water that's what with the that chair. was. What was horrible was because I would be completely covered with mud, my hands all muddy, and no seams would be flying up my nose and in my ears and chewing happily away and you couldn't rub them away. It's just part of the deal. I was always impressed with how soft the sand was here because there was so little wave action. As I mentioned, I grew up in Colorado and it was quite a while before I came out here, but coming to Florida was like coming to the tropics because there was so much wildlife, especially for a biologist. And I remember coming out here and standing on this beach looking at the sunset and thinking to myself that I was never going to go back to Colorado, that this was the place. Yeah, these are mangroves. Gotcha. That's what's laying all over the... Yeah. Mud flats up front on the other side. Yeah. Ooh, we have a dead bird over here, it looks like. Yep. Oh, it's a vulture. There's two of them. See the big claw? Wonder if it got nailed by an eagle. What are they, Steve? They're vultures. Ah. 
But this cliff, of course, was not here. All of this was overgrown and the, the hill came clear out to here. I think so. It wasn't like this when we came back 10 years ago. When was the storm of the century? 93. That was oh. a no-name storm of 93 in March, the March well, 19, That's the storm that went up the whole East Coast. We were living in Atlanta. We got 14 inches of snow. I don't know. That I mean, well, I don't our, our reunion was after, the, was after the storm of the century. But yeah. Those, I'd, those just I all, think this is more recent than that. That's probably Hermine, because they've all caved, the banks caved off. Haven't right, they? right. And none of this stuff is broken down either. Yeah. Um, it came out to about about here, and there were some trees that had fallen over, a lot of oaks and palms. Um, it always looked very picturesque with all the skeletons of the trees but it came much farther and it was was not a cliff like that at all yeah the beach was it was more sloping and the beach was a lot narrower then right steve yeah it was a lot narrower same kinds of vegetation, same kinds of vegetation. i don't see anything unusual and depending on on the time of year and the storms you would get huge rack lines of course of roots and plants. Oh no, this is really extensive. I'm kind of wondering if the shell midden didn't get washed away. Is it monarchs? Mm -hmm. It's time for the monarchs to be migrating, and this has monarchs all over it. Monarch butterflies. And some gulf fritillaries, too. Cedar Key is really well known as a a flyway for birds and they, they come through Cedar Key but on this island of course they would come and rest and I was just getting into bird watching I saw lots and lots of unusual birds on migration when I was out here some I've never seen again oh well, worm-eating warbler um, there's something called the black whiskered vireo uh, evening grosbeaks and rose-breasted grosbeaks were out here. Um, painted bunnings, there were lots of painted bunnings you would see here. I think they rested mostly here. Um, I, and they, I realize now they were on their migratory routes and this was just a good place for them to hang out. But there were, and on this part of the island there weren't as many birds. The birds were on the north part, including the ibis. But of course, there were always birds flying over, cormorants. Sometimes you would see ibis foraging out, out here. So did Joe come down here and walk around much? No, not much. Occasionally of an evening uh -huh. before dusk. If there was a breeze. Yes, if there was a breeze. I used to walk around here at night. One night I was walking back and of course always went barefoot and it was dark and I saw a big round thing right here on the sand and it was just about here and I thought, oh, it's one of those big purple sand dollars. Remember the big encopy? Uh -huh. Purple sand dollars. And I walked right up to it, so I was about like I am to you. And I turned my flashlight on and it was a coiled water moccasin. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 
and there would have been nobody to help me. Yeah. The university or anybody else. That's right. <laughs> well, we would have found you eventually, probably. Do you remember the animal collector, Buck? Yes. I remember once he was out here. And he, he got hit with a stingray, didn't he? Down on the point, and he got hit with a stingray and crawled all the way back. Yeah. Because he was out here by himself. Yep. Well, that was always the mantra when you worked on the sand flat, shuffle your feet. Yeah, shuffle your feet so you scare away the sand off, uh, the rays. Rays. And we would come out at night and go out to West Bank Well, out the sand there. dollars were probably frightened too. They just couldn't do much about <laughs> That's it. That's right. Okay. <laughs> we'd come out at night on, on low tides and walk around on these flats and you'd see all kinds of huge stingrays. Ah. See many of these guys. Uh, it's a hermit crab. Uh. And these are all fiddler crab burrows. You can see here where the where the trees used to be. These were the guys that were falling down way back when. And now it's washed all the way back into that area. Well, look at the overburden of sand on them too. Right, it's right. moved a lot of some Lots big of winds sand. and waves and moved sand up here on the beach. So. Yep. I'm wondering if maybe the shell midden wasn't around here somewhere because you can see shells up there. I believe that it was. I think this this area looks familiar, but it's all changed. I didn't even, I mean, I remember the shell midden, but we didn't walk up in there because there was so much land in, in front of us. Did A.D. ever tell you the story about the, the headless soldier in the water? If he did, I don't recall. What well, was it? At night, you could hear splashes from mullet jumping. Uh -huh. And everybody said that that was a Civil War soldier who died out here riding along the, the beachfront. Hmm. When I came here in 68 and 69, there were already other students that were working out here. There was a guy that worked on pipe fish. Um, and even years before that, Tom Hopkins, who was a graduate student, made a key to the echinoderms of the Cedar Key area, which I've just recently come across. Oh, well, that's right. Tom ended up being the director of the marine lab over at uh, Ocean Breeze, didn't he? Uh, or, Dolphin Island. Dolphin Island, yeah. In Alabama. He was used a to run into him at uh, yep. estuary meetings. Yeah. I went to an econoderm meeting um, this fall, or actually late summer, and was told that he passed away this year. Ah. Econoderms being the Sand dollar sea urchins, brittle stars. All of those starfish. Starfish, sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers. Well, yeah, here's more shells too. Yeah. You think those are coming out of the bank rather than washed know. up from somewhere? That's hard to say. They're not new. True. And all these tubes are of worm tubes called a worm called Diopatra. Back in the day, it's I could never get crab. this far around. Right, we wouldn't. We didn't come much further than this. See yeah. all the fiddler crabs? Yes.
And in fact, I think when you got down here, it was you had to walk in the water if you wanted to get all the way to Sand Point. Uh -huh. I think that there was vegetation down, yeah. down here. We just rammed the boat into the sand, threw the anchor out and hopped out and yep. started walking. <clears throat> Yes, we had little 13-foot boats with, uh, what was it, 15-horsepower motors on them. Yeah. And they... 15-horsepower uh, Evinrudes, I believe. And yeah. They only ran occasionally. Yeah. So you'd come over to Cedar Key, and there would be a boat waiting. You'd load your gear, head out here, and if you were lucky, you'd get all the way here. If something didn't clog or the boat stopped running. I remember over there is Snake Key and Mike Osterling and I were over there. That was one of my dredging stations and the boat stopped running and we had to paddle all the way back with our hands. We only had one paddle. We were out here one time and uh, supposed to be a hurricane headed this way. Might have been just a tropical storm, but we loaded, we only had two of the Johnson boats left. And we loaded everything into the boats. We got about halfway, halfway across. My wife was here, me, I think the pages might have been here. We got about halfway across and said, my wife said, you have to go back. I left my engagement and my wedding ring on the, on the dresser at the lighthouse. And I said, <laughs> well, first of all, we can't turn around. We gotta get out of here. Secondly, uh, that lighthouse has been there for at least a hundred years. It'll stand this. And I doubt if anyone comes back or comes over to the island before we can get back here. So. Sure enough, we got back eventually and the rings were still there. So. And that's good. Just another transgression though. <laughs> yeah. Well, it used to be really scary for me from Colorado. Even when the waves were only two feet high, I was so inexperienced. I didn't know very much about boat driving. Well, at least you, you uh, Steve talks about being from Colorado. I was a farm boy from Iowa. Talk about a flatlander out in the middle of a, uh, what looked like a big ocean. Yeah. Um, all new to me too. Following our dreams to be marine biologists. That's right. <laughs> I don't know what it is about Midwestern people who decide to go to the sea and become marine biologists. Huh? Call of the adventure, I guess. Yeah. I know what it was for me. I watched too much sea hunt as a kid. That was a, <laughs> that was a Kirk Douglas show on TV that he was always diving underwater. Yeah, and, but it uh, wasn't Kirk Douglas. Uh, it no, was, it wasn't. Uh, oh, oh, he's the shit. actor, his son's a famous actor now, I'll think of it. But he, he used to use an old double holes regulator. Yep. And I thought that was the neatest thing. Oh, you remember when we all took our scuba lessons together, including Frank? Uh-huh. Did you, you did that too, right? No, YMCA? I, I took mine in Oregon. You got, I already had mine when I got here. Oh, we all did it together, and it was very different than the way they teach it now. Yeah. So we might as well stop. This is, you really couldn't go beyond here back then. It's, it's very different now. Yeah. That, I believe that's Sandpoint, isn't it? Yeah, Sandpoint right out there. Yeah. That's, see, there's where the, where you come in, there's the, the first. Seahorse Channel, yeah. Channel. That, that little. Sand point out there and in the shallows is where I, I collected a lot of uh, my organisms. I worked on uh, the five loony old or five hold sand dollar. I can remember the first time I met Frank Machuro uh, and John Page and I shared this. We were so disappointed because we thought we would come into his lab and he'd say, okay, John and John, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do that. <laughs> and uh, kind of direct us and he looked to us and. We said, he, he said, well, what would you like to work on? And John was from New Hampshire, and I was from the farmlands in Iowa. I don't know, we've never been here. What do we work on? He said, well, 
why don't you go out and see your key and figure that out? Go over to Seahorse Key. So, 80 folks, we rode over in the urchin, and that was the first place. He said, John, why don't, let me drop you off over here. Why don't you start walking around, see if anything interests you. I'll, I'll come back in a week or two if you're a good boy and don't, don't, <laughs> don't uh, give me a hard time. No, he said, I'll come right back for you. But I started, he said, you know, gave me the shuffle uh, warning for the, uh, Stingrays, and I started walking around, and I got to a point every every step you'd crunch, crunch. Oh boy, hard, funny place to put gravel. And I bent down, and I was just walking on a whole bed of sand dollars. Oh. Now, well, this is kind of neat. What do these things do? And I'm still not sure, but uh, <laughs> I started working on those. So I, I uh, this was mainly a collection point. I did a lot of sampling over there, like Steve. We all did quadrants and quadrats and that sort of thing, sediment sampling and that sort of thing, but uh, I was interested in how did these sand dollars get here? Well, they, they've got a uh, pluteus, a, a larva that's planktonic called a pluteus, and then eventually the adult grows inside of them and they metamorphose and, metamorphose and settle to the bottom. And I said, well, then maybe that's the sort of thing. So I, I quickly became in the, came into the sand, girl, uh, sand dollar growing business, and uh, but I had these big stirring tables. Right. Once, right. once you got the pluteus, you had to keep them stirred. And I had these little petri dishes, and I needed power. In those days, it was only generated. So if they shut the generators off here, everything died. So I rented a little place in uh, Cedar Key. I had forgotten that. That's right. Yeah, I had a little office in there, and uh, that I ruined with seawater, and uh, so I could get power. So I come out here and collect, go in and stir them, fertilize the. Get the gametes and fertilize uh, fertilize the eggs, and then start growing sand dollars, and then test them on various uh, sediments and environments. So. so you were doing settling preferences. Settling preferences, yeah, for right. the for the uh, larvae once they settle. Yeah. And, uh, now everything's changed. Turns out it has to be bacteria first. Yeah, and, uh, and I they well, sense it. may sound like hindsight judgment. I suspected that, Steve. I just had to graduate before I could figure that out. Well, the technology had to change a little <laughs> bit, too. This, yeah. is, this yeah. is 50 years ago. <laughs> if you'll read my, my master's thesis, you'll see I speculated whether it's the May 60 si uh, sand grain size or what's living on that uh, size. What's it's, living on it. Yeah. And important. what was the name of the organism? Melita quinquase perforata. And it's now Leodia. Leodia. They Leodia. ruined me. Right, John uh, Lawrence changed the name. Oh, he did. Yeah. Well, that guy. Okay. Well, but that's got was, a This was the story. five lo five lunial one. So anyway, mm -hmm. here we are, and I got here and I got here in 1970. So uh, I don't know whether we want to date this, but it's been about 47 years since we first got uh, first came to Seahorse Key. So it's been been a while. So yeah. go ahead. Well, I have a very similar story. I expected Maturo to give me some assignment. And uh, I was here for a year and a half. I got an assistantship with Archie Carr, but I wanted to do marine biology. And finally, he said, you've, got to, you've been here a year and a half. You've got to figure out what you're going to work on. So we got in the car, and we drove from Gainesville out to Goose Cove. And uh, he said, let's stop here and walk out here. So we walked out into about knee-deep water. And he said, why don't you dig around in there and see what you can find? And I reached down and dug around and pulled up a brittle star. He said, what's that? And I said, it's a brittle star. He said, what do you know about them? Nothing. Well, why don't you work on those? Yeah. <laughs> and so I did. And it turned out that Goose Cove was a type locality for that species of brittle star. Wow. Ophiophragmus. Yeah. So, so I, I guess the point is we all kind of came here expected to be self-directed -direct, uh, by our graduate uh, research professor, but uh, to Frank's credit, he knew that we kind of had to figure out what our passion was and what we were interested in, and so we figured it out ourselves rather than uh, us. Uh, and later on, how to solve the problem, because, you know, I figured he'd say, you'd go in and say, I couldn't do this, I don't know how to do this, I've got a real problem with this analysis, and I would expect him to say, well, you do these statistics on it, and he would say, hmm, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then and you, that's all he'd say. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to be self-reliant, to yeah, figure these things out yourself. So. 
I guess in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't tell him I wanted to be a forester because I didn't like sitting in trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bless his heart. He was a good mentor, but, but you're right. He was uh, very much into uh, a little bit of direction, but not much. He thought much. the value was in you figuring out how to do things and what you wanted to do. But he made terrific sacrifices for us. We would go on cruises. At that time, there was a State University Systems Institute of Oceanography, and they had some big Otherwise boats. Otherwise known as Susio. Susio, and they yeah. had big boats, and you could sign up to go out on, on a trip with them. And he would take us out on those boats, and he would get horribly, horribly seasick. You know, he would get seasick just climbing onto the boat. So all of us graduate students would be out there looking in the dredges and having a great time. Smelling and, the diesel fumes and, coming over the transom. Right, and, and yeah. after about two days, he would finally come, <laughs> come out of his cabin, kind yeah. of pasty pale. Yeah, that's right. When we really wanted to be ornery, we'd stand around him on, on dry land and just kind of rock back and <laughs> forth and he'd have to go sit down. He shouldn't have tolerated us, bless his heart. The first time I went out with him, um, the, Elo Pierce, the first director of the lab, had a kind of a dredge that is now called a bucket dredge because he worked on uh, Amphioxus, little eel-like things. And we, would, we went out offshore and we would drop that dredge. And Dr. Maturo worked on Bryozoans. And the dredge would come up and it would be full of these special little Bryozoans called Cupulodrians. They look like a little inverted Chinese hat. Mm -hmm. And I say, <laughs> I'd have this <laughs> sieve with all these bars. I'd say, look, Frank, look. And he would just <laughs> head for the railing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think in all the time we were here, he only had one graduate student that I knew that specifically worked on That's right. something of his own research interest, and that was Edith Humphreys, who I'm yeah. not sure when Edith came here, but she was one of his doctoral students, and she worked on Bryce Owens, right? Yep. She came the same year I did, and she came specifically to work on Bryozoan systematics with him. Oh, she did? Okay. Yeah. So I didn't realize she came here when you did. Hmm. Well, maybe it was later, because we got our doctorate the same year. We were his first two doctoral students. Okay. In terms of timelines, Steve, you were here in 68. Right. Page, John Page, Mike Osterling. Tom Rudiger, who was one of Jack Kaufman's students, and myself, we all got here in 1970. So, just pointing out that Steve was a senior graduate student, but right. uh, Mike, John, and <laughs> and, uh, and still didn't have a thesis I, problem. <laughs> and I shared an office in Old Flint Hall, which was the original biology department at UF. We had Frank had an office. Eventually, down in the basement, we were up on the second floor. Yeah, and I was in a barracks, which was next to Flint Hall. You oh, should really? See, you should see Flint Hall now. They've preserved the they, old part, but they've spit it oh, up. Oh, it's beautiful. They've got big additions on it now. Yeah, I was in a barracks with Rick Fox who was finishing his master's. And right next door was Peter Pritchard, the turtle guy. Mm -hmm. And he had turtles from all over the world in big wash tubs. And he would change the water about once a month and it just absolutely reeked. Well, occasionally I'd commingle that smell with a bunch of dead sand dollars that I'd brought back and they had uh, died in their aquaria. So. We pretty well stunk the second floor up. There was, that was pretty much biology heaven then, I think. There yeah. was, who was the guy that worked on the big South American cockroaches that had tanks full of them up there? I don't remember him. Remember him? I remember, of course, Don and Don Goodman, and her name at that time was Jill Jordan, now mm -hmm. it's Jordan Goodman. And they had a kinkajou in their office. Uh, and you would walk into the office and it would climb up on your shoulder and start licking you in the ear. Uh, and if you, and you, the, the, what you were supposed to do is lean your head over so it couldn't get to your ear and then it'd run to the other side. 
but if you pushed it with your hand, it would bite you. Oh, really? And uh, the janitor wouldn't go in there because <laughs> it was filthy. The kinkajou would swing from the bars and pee on the desks. And <laughs> <laughs> The All the jungle life in Fred Hall. <laughs> oh, and uh, the chairman, Burner, oh, it just drove him crazy. He uh, dumb Lewis, Jill. Yeah, Lewis Burner was the chairman. He just probably went nuts. He did. He thinking hated. about what was happening to his building. He hated those two. <laughs> but for a biologist, I mean, we were... It's not like today. All of my graduate students in the last few years have been married when they came. Uh -huh. None of us were married. You got married the first year, right? I was here a year, and then I got married, yeah, and that's, that's yeah. late spring. And So we were all single graduate students, and we would just do, I mean, you stay at work. All the profs would go home at 5 o'clock, and all the students would come out and talk biology. Well, now, Paige and, maybe they got married that year, but Paige and uh, Kathy, yeah. Rudiger were married when they were here. Osterling, too. Osterling got divorced that first year. Yeah, because that was the deal. We first we got married in the spring of 71. We drove down here with all our worldly possessions in a VW and the smallest trailer that U-Haul made, <laughs> threw them in an apartment and came over here to live for the summer. My wife wasn't working, all the other wives were, so the never was really said but kind of the tacit understanding, at least with John, uh, Mike and Tom, was that my wife would cook for them all at night, <laughs> which didn't sit too well. So anyway, she did her best. Yeah. I mean, you're a little Iowa farm girl, and then you come out here, and there's no air conditioning. And it's well, yeah, hot, like you're wrong fire. there. We're talking St. Louis city girl. Oh, city girl. Yeah, so uh, we weren't. Uh, I mean, in those days, it was considered camping to have to have to stay in a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not her thing. No. Well, that's a good I've been, well, I've been forgiven, though. I, I'm, good, I'm convinced good. I've been forgiven, but it's never been forgotten, let mm -hmm. me tell you. It's a good test of a marriage. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> well, did, did one she... of the problems I... One of the mistakes I made is... I mean, you know... Every president knows this. Don't write down something that you don't want to have retained for eternity. Before we got married, I wrote a nice letter that said, uh, Dear Joe, I want to tell you about an opportunity we have to live on a tropical island for a summer after we get married. Consider uh, evening tropical breezes, and I actually said wafting through the palm trees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, convincing her that, yeah, this would be a good thing. So she said, okay. Little be notes to me, has she kept, she kept that crinkly old letter, and I get, I, she reads it to me every once in a while <laughs> when she knows I'm out on a limb for something. So, <laughs> yeah, 46 years later, we're still married. Yeah, and she can still remind you. Yeah, but I still get reminded. That's okay. Good. And in those days, we only ran the what? The generator about nine o'clock. Yep. Everything was propane, propane refrigerator. Yeah. So we had gas. You could so cook. We had gas. Just didn't have lights. Didn't and have fans. Used, it was hot. Yep. We used lanterns. Uh huh. And somebody had to go down and shut the generator off at night. Yep. And uh, let it cool down a little bit. And you had to be careful because uh, to start it that evening, sometimes they ran it during the day, it was still warm, and the cotton mouths like to come and yep. boil around the manifold. So you'd reach in to start it, and there'd be a snake staring you right in the eye. Yeah. So you always had to look first. Yep. That was another thing that, that Dr. Maturo did because there I don't think there was a generator on here until we would go basically do midnight raids at Camp Blanding where the yeah we had access army to surplus stuff was uh, military surplus over at Camp Blanding near Stark and we'd go and 
You're right. Those are military generators. Those are weren't military they? generators, and over the time I was here, we got two of them. He always wanted to build a lab on the mainland. And now there is one. Yeah. I don't know. I think you were gone the time that uh, Harry Merritt was in the, was a professor of arch uh, architecture. Uh -huh. And he had his graduate students build a physical model of a marine lab over here. and. They treated Frank like the client, and Frank said, hey, John, you wanna, this would be interesting. Come and provide some input, and we had juries and that sort of thing with those students. Uh, I have tried to locate that model, probably got pitched. Yeah, I remember we talked about that, and I, I don't remember the model, but I remember some drawings. Yeah. Maria, I thought Maria was going through the archives and might be able to find it, but they haven't yet. But it was a kind of a, two-story kind of southern plantation style consistent with kind of keeping it low for the environment no no high-rise stuff right and he wanted to build it over by the airport yes there was some university property over there boy what a calm day no kidding in the summer, we used to come out here and see water spouts sometimes. Now, A.D. used to take us offshore in the urchin. Right. John Page was looking for... He was working on nudibranchs. He was looking for aplesia, sea hares. Right. Wasn't it? Yeah. And we'd go offshore, and that's when I could find the, the bigger purple uh, right. sand dollars and the sea biscuit sand dollars. We'd spend the day off there. That's why we all took scuba diving, so we could go out there yeah. and, and help John. So here we are at the steps. Yeah, that palm tree didn't lean like that before. Which one, this one or the other one? The other one. <sighs> that was a good walk. Should we go up the hill? Sure. I'm gonna stop a minute. Yeah, I think I'm done. <laughs> Off or on?